Here's a question for you. What do a picnic and a compost pile have in common? Give up? A compost pile is basically a catered picnic for billions of guests. All living organisms need nutrients and energy to move, grow, and reproduce. And the truth is, without proper conditions and the right balance of ingredients, there are consequences for the countless decomposers living inside a compost bin. These decomposers, which include microbes, worms, and other invertebrates, break down organic waste and leave behind dark, rich humus. The process begins when green plants transform solar energy into chemical energy through photosynthesis. Plants contain organic energy and nutrients, which are trapped in their remains when they die. That's good news for decomposers, which come in all shapes and sizes. Decomposers feed by breaking chemical bonds in the dead plant material, releasing energy for their use, and recycling nutrients back into the ecosystem. Composting is a series of techniques to manage and accelerate the natural process of decomposition. Like many things in life, the art of composting has truths and consequences. Help! How do I decide what to put in my compost bin? Call a rocket scientist. Enroll in organic chemistry. Consult your Ouija board. Mix browns and greens. Hi. Hi. I'm glad you came. Hey, Lisa. I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. I got this compost bin, and I don't really know what to do with it. Uh-huh. I got this, you know, material together, but I'm not really sure how much to put in. Okay. Well, you've got a lot of important ingredients here. Decomposers need many different ingredients to thrive. Carbon and nitrogen are two of the most important. A balanced diet for decomposers comes from mixing roughly equal volumes of carbon-rich materials, which tend to be dry and brown, with nitrogen-rich materials, which tend to be green and juicy. Most organic materials contain carbon and nitrogen in varying proportions. Straw is high in carbon, containing about 100 parts of carbon for every part of nitrogen by weight. Grass contains more nitrogen and proportionally less carbon, 15 parts of carbon to one part of nitrogen. Most dry leaves have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 50 to 1. Food scraps vary widely, but average about 20 to 1. To make hot compost, you need to provide a mixture of high carbon and high nitrogen materials, so that the final ratio is about 30 parts of carbon for each part of nitrogen by weight. What they do is they use the carbon layer as energy, uh -huh. similar to how we use carbohydrates. Oh. And then the nitrogen layer they use for growth and reproduction. Oh. So wow. with both of those in there and the oxygen and water, it's a party in your bin. Great. Okay. Water is another crucial ingredient for the compost bin. Water provides the medium for biochemical reactions, transports nutrients, and allows microorganisms to move about in the bin. When a compost pile is established, naturally occurring spores and dormant microorganisms turn active, and the pile undergoes a population explosion of amazing proportions. Bacteria are the workhorses of the process. They live by the billions in a thin film of water that surrounds moist organic material. The first bacteria to dominate the bin specialize in digesting simple sugars and starches 
while successive populations carry out the breakdown of proteins, fats, and complex carbohydrates. Gradually, the compost community diversifies. A myriad of different decomposers colonize the pile, breaking down more resistant materials like cellulose and lignin. These decomposer organisms include fungi, actinomycetes, protozoa, nematodes, sow bugs, mites, springtails, pseudoscorpions, millipedes, centipedes, and earthworms. Waste heat from the metabolic activity of bacteria has a striking influence on the temperature profile of the compost pile. At the outset, a bin typically has a moderate temperature, or mesophilic phase, which lasts for several days. The temperature of the bin rises along with the explosive increase in the number of bacteria. The size and composition of the compost determine how hot the pile becomes and how long the high temperature, or thermophilic phase, lasts. Eventually, bacteria decompose the bulk of readily available carbon and the number of bacteria and the bin temperature decline. During the final several month long mesophilic or curing phase, the compost matures as a diverse variety of decomposers complete the process. Under the right conditions, a compost pile can reach temperatures up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 65 degrees Celsius, and produce finished compost in a matter of months. Not every compost pile gets hot, but that's not necessarily a problem. The truth is, left on its own, all organic matter will eventually decompose, just as it would on a forest floor. Materials in a high carbon pile will decompose slowly, but without problems. The consequences of composting with too much nitrogen are another matter. My compost reeks of ammonia. What do I do? Give up composting. Move. Use it to mop your floors. Add more brown materials. I'm having this problem with my compost. It has this terrible ammonia odor. And I've been adding lots of grass clippings to it to see if that might help. Well, actually, the grass clippings will probably make it worse. Composts are just like people, they're omnivorous and both require a little balance in your diet. And the ammonia you're smelling here is from excess nitrogen that's being given off. We've got too much nitrogen for the amount of carbon present. And when that happens, the carbon that is there quickly gets used up and the excess nitrogen is given off as ammonia. So what we need to do is increase the, the carbon content of this a little bit. And some dried leaves would be great if you have them. Composting problems can usually be fixed with proper materials. A successful compost pile needs plenty of fresh air, water, and the right kinds of food, like a successful picnic. Without these important ingredients, the party's over. Compost smells like rotten eggs. What do I do? I hand out respirators, spray it with perfume, garnish with cheese and salsa, add a dry, coarse material. Compost should be about as moist as a wrung out sponge, damp but not soggy. In it. So, why don't we do something called the squeeze test really quickly? and that'll help us figure out whether there's too much moisture in there. And what we do is we grab a bit of the compost, and we pick it up, and we squeeze it. 
and if one or two drops comes out then that's the optimum moisture level and so we have a lot more than that and what happens when the pile gets too wet is that the anaerobic microbes take over and then they create that smell that we smell. Aerobic composting requires large amounts of fresh air. Air flows into the pile through spaces between the compost particles. If water fills these pores, airflow is blocked and a shortage of oxygen allows anaerobic microbes to dominate the pile and produce foul-smelling gases. The right balance of moisture and porosity lets air penetrate the pile. Then, aerobic organisms can break down material quickly and with little odor. And if we were to add in some straw or maybe some wood chips, then that would increase the porosity of the pile and it would allow more oxygen to come into the pile. And then the aerobic microbes would begin to predominate and the smell would go away. Adding a dry, coarse material, often called a bulking agent, helps a soggy or compacted bin loosen up and dry out, giving a competitive advantage to desirable aerobic decomposers. With all that uh, yucky wet food waste that we were just pressing with the squeeze test. And a loose, moist bin contains enough water to permit biological activity without hindering airflow through the pile. As air in the center of a compost pile heats, it rises. This helps pull in cool air from the bottom of the pile and creates a natural convection current, which is the most important mechanism for keeping the pile aerobic. Turning a compacted pile can help maintain this natural circulation. Air circulation is just one of many factors determining the internal microclimate of the compost pile. Bin size also has consequences. Help! I want hot compost. How big should I make my bin? As big as a bread box. Smaller than the Hindenburg. No bigger than your head. At least one cubic meter. Hey, Joe. Hi, Monica. How are you? All right. What do you got here? Well, I'm trying to make a compost bin, and mm -hmm. I can't figure out how big to make it. I have a big piece of wire, and, and I don't know if I should make it huge or, or, you know, much smaller. Well, you need to make it a certain minimum size. Okay. Um, the minimum you might think of is sort of a, a cubic meter, mm -hmm. about a cubic yard. Uh, so that would have to be a little bit bigger than this for okay. at least the minimum size. Part of the reason you're doing this is that you want the bin to be able to heat up the organisms that do the really active breakdown that would make the decomposition happen fastest like a pretty warm environment. So you want to create something that's large enough to hold the heat. That'll help kill any weed seeds that are in there from mm -hmm. the yard waste that you're putting in. And it'll also help the compost break down faster. The volume and surface area of a bin will determine its ability to retain heat generated during decomposition. In a compost pile with a large volume relative to surface area, waste heat is lost to the environment slowly and the core can get hot. In smaller piles, waste heat is lost more quickly. In a pile with a small volume relative to surface area, heat is lost as quickly as it is produced and the core remains cool. The truth is that people and decomposers need proper conditions to flourish. Decomposers require a balanced diet of carbon and nitrogen. Compost must be moist enough to support microbial growth. But not so moist that oxygen can't circulate through the pile. Everyone can enjoy the consequences of successful composting.